Well, thanks for having me here today. It's um, great to see the number of people here. It really is good. And it certainly fills me with confidence that um, the fight is on and we will win. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the chemicals used and released and why we need independent health review. Some stuff about the wastes, because that's something that just isn't dealt with very much at all. Uh, we'll look at some of the myths about what industry talks about when it says there's no evidence of water pollution and some of the facts that we're seeing already about air pollution. Just to make sure we know what we're all talking about, I think Ian has dealt with the issue of tight gas, but it is important to just remember that tight gas is an unconventional gas. It's found in things like limestone and sandstone. It usually does require fracking to release it, but it always requires a thing called acidation or acidizing, where you literally pump into the well um, hydrochloric acid to break apart the little calcite cements in between the sediment rocks. The hydraulic fracturing, you're probably all fully aware about this, so I do apologise for just going over it again, but I think it's worth remembering that as well as the water that goes down, so do a whole lot of chemicals, so do a whole lot of uh, traces, radioactive traces, and so does a large amount of what's called propants or sand or silica. We often get told by the industry regularly that the only people that oppose this industry are extremists, alarmists, um, anarchists. I can't think of any of the other insults I've had thrown at us. So I always like to pop this slide up there. This is from the United Nations Environment Program, and I don't think you can find a more august body than UNEP. And at the end of last year, the United Nations Environment Program put out what was called a global environmental alert. And basically they said that the production, exploration of production for unconventional gas will have, may have, unforeseen environmental impacts. Some of those will happen if the technology is not used correctly, but others will happen even if the technology is used correctly. And what they are saying is that you simply cannot regulate this industry into safety, that it is inherently unsafe. And so the things they talked about were the release of greenhouse gases, water contamination, land clearance, the, the fight for water and land for food and biodiversity, and the photo up there, which I'm sure some of you have already seen, is the lovely photo of um, our Condamine River bubbling with methane. So, the chemical additives. Most people think about fracking fluids and fracking chemicals, but I do stress every one of those um, wells that are drilled require drilling fluids as well. And the drilling fluids are used in copious quantities. We don't have publicly available data on just how much, because the industry won't tell us, but certainly when it comes to the fracking fluids that we know for each frac, for each well, anything up to 18,000 kilograms of chemical additive is used. And about 40 to 50% remains in the ground. It doesn't come back as what's called flowback. With tight gas, the EU predicted 16,000 kilograms, or 16 tonnes, of acutely toxic substances, and that's what they're seeing being used in tight gas in Europe. Now, many of the chemicals we know have never been assessed. If you've read our report, you'll probably know that two out of 23 of the most commonly used chemicals in hydraulic fracturing fluids have been assessed. The others have never been assessed for their impacts on human health or the environment. We lobbied hard our national regulators to change this. Finally, they have announced that they are doing an assessment of the most commonly used ones. So we said, well, great. Tell us which ones you're going to look at. And for the last 12 months, they have refused to give us that list. So there is a secret list. We don't know what it is. And supposedly, by halfway through next year, we're going to find out what they've assessed. But, you know, until then, it remains as it is. Very few have been. Many, many are protected under trade secrets. If you look at the safety data sheet, which comes with the chemical, and you look for the name of the actual active ingredient, many will have what's called proprietary data written there. 
not the name of the chemical, just proprietary data. And for the layperson, you can interpret that as bloody big industrial secret, we're not telling you. And they're legally allowed to do that, unfortunately. The ones where we know what they are, many have chronic and long-term health effects, many have short-term health effects. Many are carcinogens. Some data that came out of the United States earlier this year showed that of 9,000 hydraulic fracks that occurred there, over a third, 34%, used a carcinogen in that hydraulic fracturing. So the idea that somehow these are safe and not worrying is a bit of a fallacy. It's one of the myths that we'd like to explode. And so what we're really talking about is an unassessed mixture, unquantified, unqualified mixture of carcinogens, endocrine disruptors, chemicals that affect the way we think, neurotoxins, reproductive toxins, they go down and a large proportion stay in the soil and in the water tables. The other thing that's not mentioned much is this thing about propants. And often you'll hear the industry say, but it's just sand. We put it down, it goes into the cracks and supposedly it holds the cracks open to allow the gas to flow properly. Well, in some cases it's sand, but in the majority of cases, it's basically a silica polymer. Little tiny spheres of man-made spheres made out of aluminum silicates which remain in the ground. About 50,000 kilograms are used every frac for every well. So all in all, it's um, not a particularly benign process. Whoops, yep. I've just popped a few up there. It's too far for you to read, but if you'd like to read a little bit more about some of these specific chemicals, they are all in our report. But as you can see just from that list, we're talking about some serious chemicals, carcinogens, neurotoxins, reproductive toxins. We often hear that, you know, fracking's been used for ages, perfectly safe, not a problem. I like to use the industry's own words back at them. And this comes from Shenhua Cole when they were putting in an application for a CSG project. And if you can't read it, I'll just read it for you. Quote from them, drill holes or fractures may intersect with one or multiple aquifers, potentially mixing groundwater from different strata or altering groundwater chemistry through exposure to air, gas, fracking and drilling fluids, or the release of natural compounds like BTACs. That's industry's own words. That's not mine. And I think that is a pretty damning statement. I just want to cover the wastes, and then I'm just going to quickly go on and talk about some of the evidence of water and air pollution. Wastes are another issue that often gets swept under the carpet. What do we do with the mega tons of waste this industry provides? Certainly, if you look at the produce water, 0.1 to 0.8 megalitres of produced water per day per well. This is water that is contaminated with benzene, toluene, um, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, again, these are carcinogens, heavy metals, naturally radioactive substances, things that are quite safe if they remain in the ground, but not when they're um, released to the environment. What do we do with it? Well, we used to pop them into evaporative ponds. They're illegal, so we now call them holding ponds, so that makes us all feel terribly much better. You can use it for dust suppression, as the photo of that truck is exactly what he is doing. He is spraying untreated produced water onto a dusty road. What do you think happens when that dust dries out and then gets blown around and our children breathe it in? They can partially treat it. They can't treat it completely. Reverse osmosis does not take out all of the chemicals. It certainly doesn't take out the uh, small molecular weight chemicals. And then you can release it into rivers, as it's being done now, or you can sell it off to farmers. Often the same farmers who no longer have water access because their bores have been drawn down by the industry so badly. But you can sell it to those farmers, or you can even give it to the farmers. But what you don't give them is an out when it comes to any form of liability. So if that farmer uses that product and then he has a problem with his crop or his cows or his milk, the liability remains with the farmer. It doesn't go back to the company that gave him that contaminated water. 
It is with the farmer for all time. The other issue, of course, are the salts, five to eight tonnes per megalitre of uh, CSG produced water. QGC estimated 4.6 million tonnes of salt produced from their fields alone over the life of their field. The naturally occurring radioactive materials, again, safe if they remain in the ground once they're released, and we're already seeing results where we're seeing uranium and radium coming up in water. They break down to a thing called radon. Radon, according to the WHO, the World Health Organization, has no safe level of exposure. Then we have the wonderful idea, OK, if you've got a whole load of drilling muds, costs you to send them to a licensed landfill. So what will we do? Well, we'll spray them on agricultural land. That was another great idea. There's been a trial going in Queensland, and I think it's now over and it will go ahead. In New Zealand, there was a firm called Fonterra, which is the big milk producer, the equivalent to Norco in um, New Zealand. They have announced about a month or so ago that they will not take milk from any farm that uses drilling waste or the wastes of CSG on their property. Great. One of the reasons they did that was, of course, concerns for contamination. But the other reason was because the cost of testing for that contamination was around $80,000 per sample. So as you can imagine, they're not going to pay for that, and the farmers obviously couldn't either. And for the loony idea of the week award goes to New Grow Landscaping, who thought it was a brilliant idea to incorporate drilling and fracking wastes into compost. Great idea. So they have got a proposal in now to spread this as soil improver on a property near Brian Monk in Queensland. It is absolutely atrocious, and I really do say to you, please, spread this, because this has to be stopped. It is an absolutely obscene idea. OK. Evidence of air pollution. Well, we have massive evidence of air pollution, despite what the industry tell us locally. If you go to what's called the National Pollutant Inventory, which is a major government program that John and I worked on 20 years ago to get it up and going. It's a right to know program where companies must report, and they have shown in that that there's certainly significant contamination, both from the gas fields and the infrastructure. But I'm going to leave it to Wayne to tell you about some of the levels, because I think they'll shock the living daylights out of you. Flaring is a big issue. The US EPA has banned it. As of 2015, flaring will not be allowed in the US. In Australia, the industry have basically said that it's common industry practice. Well, great, it's common industry practice. What are we supposed to do? Just sit and tolerate it. Flaring creates a whole range of contaminants, and those go into the air, move with the um, air circle. We've got problems with transport and equipment, of course, all of the diesel, which we know is a carcinogen. We've also got particulates, silica problems. We've done some testing in the Tara estate and certainly have found a range of what's called volatile organic compounds. Some very serious chemicals have been found in the air there, some above levels that would be accepted in places like California. Um, they have been pretty much dismissed by the Queensland government but that, that won't stop us. We will continue this testing and we'll continue to show that the industry does cause air pollution. What's important are the results we're getting are very, very similar to the results that other communities in the United States are also getting. What's also very interesting is the tests, are the results of the tests are very um, consistent with the range of symptoms the residents are suffering. But again, Wayne will go into that. As some of you would know, the Southern Cross University did some um, air monitoring in Tara and showed that for atmospheric radon, for carbon dioxide and methane, that the levels were three times greater within the gas fields than outside the gas fields, and they were strongly correlated with the number of wells, which again, I think, shows quite clearly that we have an issue to do with contamination 
of air by the industry. And we also undertook some sampling um, eight hour, for an eight-hour monitoring around the wells and came up with what's called chlorofluorocarbons, which for the older of us in the audience may remember, these were the chemicals that destroyed the ozone, that produced the ozone hole, that made the fact that we all suffer skin cancers. And they are still being produced and released by this industry. Um, again, our results are very, very um, uh, consistent with the US study, which looked at 44 hazardous air pollutants they tested over a year, found these contaminants regularly, and what was interesting was the highest levels were during the initial drilling, not the fracking, which I think um, also makes us think about looking at the drilling issue. And so last one here. I get absolutely fed up with hearing from the industry over and over again, there is no evidence of water pollution from fracking. So up there I put number one. The study that was done in the pavilion, Wyoming, that's a quote from the US EPA. Again, I'll read it for those who can't see it. Basically says, compounds associated with hydraulic fracturing from shale gas contaminated aquifers at or below the depths used for domestic water supply. Black and white, US EPA. Again, I don't think in any industry can say that there is not a problem with water contamination. That was one of three major studies the US EPA has done. In Pennsylvania, the Department of uh, Environment Protection there has listed 161 incidents of water pollution from the industry over a four-year period. So the idea that there isn't a risk to the water is one of those fallacies that we just should put to bed as soon as possible. If we come closer to home, BTEX, benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene were found in four of, five of the 14 monitoring water bores of Arrow Energy. This again comes from their own website. Um, and benzene was found at six and 15 times the Australian drinking water standard. That's contamination in anybody's book. Um, we did some testing of a wellhead 24 hours after it was fracked. We found a range of volatile organic compounds. Some of them are carcinogens, um, and again, benzene and heavy metals. Um, there's a private drinking water bore that's been tested in Queensland. Toluene, methane found in the bore, but also interestingly found in the air above the bore. And in the Pilliga forest, which you heard about just recently, um, seven months after a spill of produced water, we found lead, mercury, chromium, hydrocarbons, and phenols, and methane at the discharge site of where they were discharging so-called treated water was 68 times higher than upstream, where there was no methane detected. So again, I think quite clear evidence. And of course, there's the famous National Academy of Sciences study, which shows, regardless of all the other things, if you look at methane in drinking water bores around gas wells, the closer you are to the gas well, the higher the level of methane. And if you're within a kilometer, you would be up to 60 times the level of methane if you were away from that. So with that, I'm going to leave you. But because my talk is always so depressing and people tell me I'm such a downer, I thought I'd put you a lovely positive side up there, because that's where we're going. And thank you very much for listening.